Praise the Lord. Remain standing for the benediction, okay? No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> wow, we've been to church and we're only 10 minutes in. Hallelujah. Hey. Now let me ask you, what do you think about these students up here? Yeah. Well, praise the Lord and happy Father's Day. Everybody say that out loud. Happy, happy Father's, Father's Day. Day. Yeah. And listen, there's something else we need to celebrate uh, right now in this moment. Um, Laura Underwood, where are you? Where's Laura? Heart transplant, Laura Underwood's in church today. You know, sometimes we say, you know, when God saved us, we got a new heart. But she got a new heart. <laughs> it's great to see you today, Laura and Steve and their family. So many have prayed for them. If you don't know her story, uh, what, just about 30 days ago, they got the call, and she went to Emory and had a heart transplant. And so uh, 30 days later, here she is in church. Uh, so we, we just so praise the Lord for that this morning. Listen, if you're visiting with us today, today I hope you're getting it that you've landed in a good spot. And uh, we're so glad to have you. Uh, if you'll take the, the tear-off section of your worship guide, fill that out, and then after the service, take it to our guest services counter, which is right out that door right there. And we've got a special gift for you. We'd love to say hello, and uh, thank you for coming our way. Right now, we want to be sure everyone feels loved and welcomed in the house. Turn around, say hello to those around you, and let's continue to worship together. <laughs>
Good morning. morning. Happy Father's Day. I always like telling women Happy Father's Day on Happy Father's Day. It's just fun. They can have a good day too, right? But today was about the dads. And so this morning we got here super early and uh, we celebrated what we called Papa Palooza. And if you can spell that, you get another prize. But we had three competitions. We had a casting competition, we had an archery competition, and we had a putting competition. And from each of those, we had a winner. And so we are going to recognize those winners with a $50 gift card to Bass Pro Shop. So, in the archery competition, this is my favorite because I didn't expect this person to win. In the archery competition, we're gonna recognize Mr. Mike Odom. Well done, well done. Thank you. In the casting competition, Mr. Andy Harrell. And then finally, in the putting competition, See up there, Mr. Steve Whitson. Just gonna hold this for you. Oh, give it to your wife. It's Father's Day, we don't give stuff to women. Steve's serving very faithfully up there. Hey, real quick, let me tell you about something next week. Next week after church, we're gonna have a church-wide lunch. It's gonna be to help raise some money for the women's ministry, the, the blessings bags that we're doing, and then several other things that, that the women's ministry puts on. They're gonna. They just need some help. And so we're going to have a lunch for anybody that wants to come next week after church. If you will call or email the church office by tomorrow and let us know you're going to come. They're going to have spaghetti, multiple types of spaghetti. They're going to have salads. They're going to have dessert. It's going to be a great lunch. Uh, where they're asking for a suggested donation of about $5 a person, or you can go up to $20 for a family. If you want to give more, they will not turn it down. I promise you that. Uh, but just a great time to get together as a church family, have lunch. Uh, then you don't have to figure out where you're going. Like Father's Day is going to be nightmarish today, figuring out where you're going for lunch. There's going to be long lines everywhere. So next week, go ahead and plan ahead. Call in, let us know you're coming, and then bring your donation next week. It's going to be great. But let's pray this morning as we receive our offering. God, I thank you for who you are. God, I thank you, God, for just this morning already. God, the good times we've had of, of fellowship, God, of worshiping you, learning about you. God, and I thank you for this church and the ministries that, that it provides, God. And so I ask that this morning, as we receive our tithes, as we receive our offerings, God, you would take that money and that you would use it to your glory, God, in this place and around our community, God, and throughout the world. We thank you for who you are. We love you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I've been the 
I think he needs it. You got this. <laughs> That's good.
Well, what a great day so far. Um, you know, I saw that video, and uh, Glenn, are you in here? Are you out roaming the halls? There he is back there. He knows what I'm going to say. Uh, when he and Linda were expecting their firstborn, Alistair, there was a conversation in the office one day about babies and diapers, and, and Glenn goes, ah, uh -uh, ain't my job. Ain't my job. And the women were about to kill him, okay? But uh, it's amazing. Once Alistair came, I mean, everything changed. And he does change diapers. I, I know that for a fact. And so... Um, that's a good thing. Well, if you have a Bible today, find uh, Hebrews chapter 12. We're going to read two verses. Hebrews 12, two verses. While you're finding your place there, let me, um, let me just call your attention to something. We've, we've come with a new bulletin format. I think Scott called attention to this a couple of weeks ago. We've really simplified what we're doing. The other one was so full of information, I just got tired when I looked at it. And so what we've done is we've streamlined everything. On the back of it is the events that are closest to us and things that are that are coming uh, you'll notice that financial information attendance all that stuff that was in the other one is not in this one but if you go if you want to see that you can go by guest uh, relations out there information desk they'll be happy to 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 give that to you okay and so hebrews chapter 12 1981 um the movie chariots of fire came out who saw it anybody see chariots of fire Chariots of Fire was released uh, to theaters across the, the country. It really became a, a box office hit. And the key figure in that movie was a young man by the name of Eric who could literally, I mean, he could almost run by, like the wind. And when you look at his life, uh, he was asked why he loved to race so much. And he made this statement. He says, I believe God made me for a purpose but he also made me fast. And when I run, I feel his pleasure. You know, as, uh, as dads, as men, we, a lot of us relate to sports and we can understand racing because we've raced our brothers, we've raced our neighbors. Some of you may have run track in school. You may have played baseball and you raced down the baseline or you may have played on a football field and you may have raced up and down the football field or the basketball court or wherever. We, we get the concept of running races. And we understand this. Sometimes we win the race and sometimes we lose. I remember Matt, our oldest, when he was real young, um, he was slow. I mean, so slow that, like, really slow. <laughs> and he would play baseball, and when he would hit the, the ball, and he was running to first base, Scott, he didn't run, he catwalked. <laughs> and he's doing this. With everything he's got, you almost had to hold your finger up to see if he was moving. <laughs> and you know, but he gave everything that he had, but he was just slow. And so we understand races and we understand when we win and sometimes we understand when we lose. And, and, and really when you, when you listen to what this young man said in the movie, the, the statement relates to all of us here because the truth is God created us all for a purpose. And the purpose is for us to run the race. We run a race in this life. We run a race of faith. And, and, and the writer of Hebrews says, and when we run this faith, this race, that, that it brings God pleasure. Now, the word faith in the Bible is an interesting word. It, it, it's really used as a verb and a noun. And Hebrews chapter 11 verse 1 says, now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. And really, when you think about faith, you got to think of it this way, that faith affects our past, our present, and our future. Our past, our present, and our future. Because our faith is really anchored in God, okay? And so he's the God of yesterday, today, and forever. And this is the thing that's hard for us to grasp sometimes, is that when God looks at our life, he has a panoramic view of our life, that God knew who we were before we were even born. He knew when we were born. He, know, he, he knew how we would live, and he knew how we would finish the race of life. And here's the thing, he knows everything in between. He knows the good, the bad, and the ugly. 
He knows the struggles and, and he knows the hurt and he knows the pain and he sees the victory and he sees the successes and, and God sees it all because he's a God of yesterday, today, and forever. And so as we run this race, God understands all that's going on in our life. But here's the thing, he says, as we run the race, it gives God pleasure. So we're in process. Well, Hebrews chapter 12 is one of the great passages of faith in the Bible. And the writer lays out in clear terms different elements on the race. And the thing we've got to understand is that, is that we are running races, guys. As a dad, you're running a race that God predetermined that you would run. He knew before you even were that you would be a dad one day. He knew before you even were how many children that you had. He knew before you were the sexes of, of your children. I mean, he knew all of that before we were even born. And so he's determined that we run this race. And so it's important that we comprehend what's happening. Look at what he says here. Therefore, since we have so great a cloud of witnesses surrounding us, let us lay aside every encumbrance and the sin that so easily entangles us, and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us. This is key. Fixing your eyes on Jesus, the author and finisher of your faith, who for the joy set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and sat down at the right hand of God. Well, I want to talk about three things today that we keep in mind as we live our life, as we run the race, three things. Number one is this, is that the saints are the encouragers of our race. Notice he talks about being surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses. In other words, these are people that really were forerunners of the race. These witnesses, they've already run their race. I mean, they're on the other side and they're looking. And what an encouragement to know that, 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 that we, are, we are living on a playing field. And we are surrounded by a cloud of witnesses. And this stadium is almost like a horizon-filling cloud. It just goes up and up and up. I know that we live in the southeast and football is huge and how many, I don't know, how many does Georgia seat in their stadium? 90,000? 98,000. 98, you know, there's this arms race now to see who seats the most. I think Michigan has the largest college football stadium and, and we get a glimpse of that. You know, when we're sitting there in our recliner on Saturday afternoon and, and we're watching the football game, I mean, the players are on the field and, and surrounding them is a huge cloud of witnesses. For 18 years, I lived in Jacksonville before I came here and every year when Georgia and Florida would play, uh, I would go down there to the stadium and help some friends of ours who owned a sandwich shop and they delivered sandwiches uh, right after halftime to the locker rooms. And I can remember that Matthew and Rusty Smith were, they were like five years old. And we'd gone into the Florida locker room and we we're putting these box lunches in the locker and a security guard came and said, who, 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 who do these belong to? And we said, us. He said, they're going with me and kind of winked at us. And he took them by the hand and they left. Well, when we got through with everything, we looked around and said, where are our kids? He said, oh, they're out there on the sideline. And we walked out of the tunnel there and I looked up and it was, what an incredible sight. One side, black and red. The other side, orange and blue. And on the field are the players. You get the picture. As you live your life, as you run the race, we're on the playing field. Those that are watching have gone before us. They've run their race. They're looking back. They see clearly now. The Bible says that now we, we look through a, a glass dimly. In other words, we don't really grasp the whole concept of eternity. And, and we, really, we don't understand the whole concept of grace. And, and we really don't understand everything about God. But they have crossed over and they're watching us run this race. 
Well, there's a lot of great stadiums in the world. The largest stadium in the world is, is Stahol Stadium in Prague. 220,000 people at seats. Americana Municipal in Rio, 200,000 when it was built. Record attendance was 1950. They had 199,000 people in one place. Largest covered stadium in the world is Azteca, Mexico City, 105,000 people. But those stadiums that have been built by man pale in comparison to the stadium that God has, full of witnesses. And they encourage us. They're witnessing to us. In other words, they're testifying of their own experience as they ran the race of faith. I mean, what would, the, what would the crowd look like if you were to go up and, and you were just to scan up in there? I mean, who could you pick out? Well, up there you may look and you may pick out Noah, who after seeing God's mighty act, went out and got drunk. Can you imagine that? Abraham, the father of our faith, even though he was justified by faith, you read his story and he lied about his relationship with his wife. Jacob would be in the crowd. His very name meant deceiver. David with all of his problems, and, and if you could talk to them, they were saying this, look, we were real, live human beings, but we want you to understand something. There is a way up and out of this world that you're living in by faith. Because if you talk to Noah a little bit more, you would say, you know what? Noah, tell me about it. Noah would say, I got sober and I became an heir of righteousness. Abraham would say, I learned to tell the truth, became a father of a nation. Jacob said, I became a prince. And David said, with everything I went through in my life, I become a man after God's own heart. And so guys, hear them cheering for you. There is a way up and out by faith. R.T. Kimball makes this statement. He says, the faith that fizzles at the finish had a fatal flaw at the first. You say, well, what do I do? What do I do? You keep running. You keep running. But they're encouraging us. As you look at the cloud, you begin to realize that, that, the, that the world is not your home and that because of the testimonies of God's grace by those that have gone on before, that there really is hope. I tell you, when you look at the world today, you have a hard time having any hope. I mean, with everything that took place in Orlando in the last week and a half, you have a hard time saying, where is there any hope in this world? A young lady signing autographs, a guy walks up and shoots her. Somebody goes into a nightclub, people are in there, socializing, having a good time, he walks in there and he kills 50 of them, shoots them like dogs. A two-year-old walking by the water with his mom and dad is grabbed by an alligator and drowned. And you, you find yourself asking, where is God in all of this? God is exactly where he's always been. He's the God of yesterday, today, and forever. And there is hope through faith. And so when you look around the world of traps and snares and chaos and confusion and the devil and his influence, you may not always see God's hand, but understand this, God's plan will not be thwarted. But secondly, they're encouraging us, but you're to be active during the Bible says, let us lay away every weight in the sin that entangles us. The picture here is a runner that is just stripping it off. And stripped down to the point that he's nearly naked. I mean, he's running and he's throwing off everything that is entangling him. He's discarded things that would impede him. You know, there's two things that hinder us when we run. Good things, bad things. They hinder us sometimes in our, in our, in our, in our running of our race. Sin in, in, entangles us. 
there was a key phrase I told you to circle there in your listening. You remember what it was? Anybody remember what I said? Pay close attention to this. Looking to Jesus. You know, so much of the time our eyes are on everything but Jesus. It's on the world, it's on the circumstances, it's on people, it's, it's on this, it's on that. We're trying to do this, trying to do that. And, and, and sometimes we, we get our eyes off of Jesus and we get our eyes on things that trip us up. But there's good things. I mean, a bass boat could impede you. A golf club could slow you down. Relationships, family. I mean, even ministry can bog us down to the point sometimes to where we, we just don't run the race. Our eyes are on other things other than what they ought to be on. But notice the journeys before us. Let us run with endurance the race that is set before us. Here's what these guys understand. They understand where you are because they've been there. Uh, they understand temptation. They understand chaos. They understand hard times. They understand unexplainable circumstances. I mean, all you have to do is take your Bible and open it up and begin to read it. And I mean, think about Job. He lost his family in the span of just a few hours, but yet Job remained faithful to God. He never blamed God for wrongdoing. Job understands when something happens that you can't explain. And so they understand where we're coming from. They understand what we're, they're dealing with. They understand the frustration of what it means to fail God. I read, a, uh, uh, I read a post this morning on Facebook. Larry Thompson, my good friend who pastors First Baptist Church of Fort Lauderdale, showed a picture of him and his dad. 20 years ago, he said, had the honor of preaching my dad's deacon ordination 20 years ago. And then he put down there, he says, my mom was not in favor of it. Because she said, quote, your dad keeps slipping and he cusses too much, unquote. Larry's response to his mom was, mom, if that became a criteria, we wouldn't have many deacons and pastors either. I mean, we understand what it means to fall. We understand what it means to fail. We understand the sting of conviction. We understand the discomfort uh, of living our life. But understand this, that even though you are where you are, there is a group, a multitude that's cheering for you. Tertullian in 70 A.D. wrote a book entitled On the Martyrs, and he talks about in that book how that in the, in the early days of the church that as Christians were being led to be slaughtered, that the other Christians in the gulags would, would call out to them and they would say, keep the faith, stay close to the cross. In other words, when we fall, we get up. We get back on schedule. But then the last thing is that Jesus is the author of our race. Looking to Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith, he began it, he finishes it. Who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame. Jesus has paid the price. And see, the reason you can run this race is because of what he did on the cross. And the Bible says he's the author and the finisher of our faith. Your faith begins with him and it ends in him. But then it says he sat down at the place of authority, the right hand of God. In this world, sometimes we find ourselves networking with people of influence 
to help us at times. Maybe to get a job. Maybe to make a move. And we call in people of influence. Jesus is the ultimate influence. He sits at the right hand of God. He sits at the place of authority. And he intercedes on our behalf. Run the race. You say, well, I fall down. We all do. Get up. Run. I've been delayed. Get up and run. Because when we run, it gives God pleasure. Father, so often we, we, we just struggle with life and the results. We struggle with the circumstances of the world. We struggle with ourselves. And I pray today, God, that, that in this we will understand there's hope in Christ. That he overcame sin, death, and the grave. And that we overcome because of him. In just a moment, we're going to stand and have a closing song. And maybe you're here today and you don't know Jesus. You've never trusted Christ. To trust Christ doesn't mean you'll be perfect. It just means you're forgiven. And if you want to know what it means to trust Christ, when we stand and sing, if you want to slip out the doors in the back and take a left down the hallway, there's a banner there that says we're here to answer your questions, and there's some people that will wait on you right there and be willing to talk with you about trusting Jesus. Maybe you've got questions about what it means to be a member of this church. They can answer your questions. Maybe you need someone just to pray with you. They're there for you. Now, Lord, thank you for this day. Thank you for these men. Thank you for these fathers. And I pray today, God, that as we run, when we stumble, we get up. When we fall, we get back on track. And we keep running. Because our faith is a past, present, and future faith. Because our God is the God of forever. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's stand. Uh -huh.